Good morning, everybody. It is Monday, July 11th, 2022, and this is the Retirement Income Options Program. Uh, every Monday at noon for subscribers and released to the public usually on Monday night. So I want to talk a little bit about what we talked about on Thursday. Just a quick summary. I believe that the stock market will bottom in the second half of the year. I think it'll probably be a double bottom. My guess is that in September or October, the Federal Reserve starts to back off. I think that they're already starting to win the inflation war. You're seeing real estate prices start to come down, level off and come down, depending on what market you're in. Employment remains at high levels, uh, at full employment, really. Uh, there's people coming back into the workforce, many of them baby boomers working part-time or three-quarter time after basically a, a two-year uh, retirement due to COVID. And you have uh, oil seemingly on a plateau as Canada is promising to supply more oil. And Saudi Arabia has clicked up uh, production just a little bit in the last month or two, which was part of their schedule. But it looks like they're on the high end of their schedule, and they may even be making up for some of the oil that other OPEC members can't put in. That's, of course, offset by Russian oil that's not finding its way into the market, although most of that oil is finding its way into the market and heading off to uh, China and even to India uh, that simply can't afford to strictly impose the sanctions that Europe is doing. But what Russia has really done has accelerated the clean energy transition as Europe is bailing out some of their energy producers and financing heavily alternative energy. India is doing the same thing on financing clean energy. It's two richest people are at the forefront of that. So when we take a look at the markets right now, it was a year ago that I really started beating the drum on, hey, we got to be careful in 2022. By the end of 2021, we were heavy in cash. Uh, I reiterated that in January several times. It is probably too late to be a big time seller without finding somewhere to put the money right away. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you need to get rid of anything that is potential a zombie stock or ETFs that are too correlated to the S&P 500 and you want to upgrade your portfolio to better holdings. Holdings that are part of the fourth industrial revolution, which is very broad. Think AI and everything tied to AI and 5G, uh, the internet of things, cloud computing, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. Those are all fourth industrial revolution ideas, as well as decarbonization, which is what the accounting firms are calling clean energy. And decarbonization is something that even Senator Joe Manchin has glommed on to by basically demanding uh, in order to get the Build Back Better, which I think is going to be a balanced Build Back Better passed sometime in the next few months, uh, that they really include carbon capture incentives. This, of course, is a big payoff to the fossil fuel industry, which will help them transition from being super dirty to being less dirty and maybe even carbon neutral in you know 30 years or so. In any case, digitization, decarbonization, and decentralization, if you put those three things into a search engine together, you come up with a lot of hits, including from Ernst & Young and all sorts of other accounting or major research firms. It is a theme. It is something that you need to be a part of. The fourth industrial revolution is part of that digitization part of the decarbonization, and part of the decentralization. So those are all ideas that you have to wrap your head around. New technology and a move to being more sustainable is the future. And if you're not accepting that yet, uh, you know, I had one lady quit the service because she said that that's not what she believes in. I don't care if it's what you believe in. I, I really don't. If you can't invest in those things, you're going to miss out on most of the gains over the next 10 to 20 years. It's just the way that it is. Sure, there's some sin stocks out there that will probably do well either way, but the world is moving way faster than you think. It is that disruption, it is that transition that causes people to think, oh my God, I'm scared, I think things are getting worse. 
look, generation to generation, things have been getting better for 500 years and really getting better since World War II. It's just going to keep getting better and better and better the way that it has always gotten better. But transition is difficult for people's psychology and it affects their emotions, which ends up causing bad financial decisions. Saw somebody on Facebook today, a friend of mine posted that his uh, in-laws family once owned a track of land in Boston. I forget exactly what it's called, uh, but it connected two parts of Boston through some marshes and they didn't like it. They decided it was too hard to work. So they left and they just abandoned that land. That land today is worth billions of dollars. Granted, it's 300 years later, but I think that there are going to be trillions of dollars made in the next decade or two in this whole transition to a more digital, more decentralized, and more decarbonized economy. And when you take into account the fact that India and China have to move in that direction just to survive, to prevent civil wars probably, you realize just how big these movements are. And then the countries that are adjacent and nearby and dependent on the big economies financially or for their economic well-being, they have to move in those directions too. So once again, I implore you, don't fight the change. Try to understand it. Don't try to rationalize it away through ideology. Think about it for what it is. And remember grandpa's advice, follow the money. The big money is heading in these directions. So should you. And right now, because of the bear market and because of all things small cap getting thrown out and many things mid cap getting thrown out, you are getting some amazing opportunities to buy companies that are in the hundreds of millions of dollars right now or a few billion that quite possibly and quite probably many of them will be worth over $10 billion, many $20 billion, $30 billion, $40 billion, $50 billion, and a few hundred billion plus companies out of that basket of stocks that I largely cover in the small and mid cap space that are anywhere from a couple hundred million dollars to a few billion dollars right now. There are going to be a lot of 10 baggers and some 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 baggers over the next 10 to 20 years. If you can put those things out on your radar, if you can look out to the horizon, and try to make the glare, which is always blurry, into something that makes sense. If you can understand the direction that things are going and scatter your portfolio of 20 to 30 stocks and several ETFs in that direction, stay in between the bumpers is all you need to do to make a lot of money. But selling out of panic, selling because you think that you're going to catch it lower, usually is a bad idea. A slow scaling in process is almost always the right way to do things. Granted, you got to manage some taxes here and there, and we'll talk about that later in the year as we get to the fourth quarter. But in general, slow scaling in at wide price points, double digit price differentials, you know, not buying every 2% lower, buying maybe a 10 or 15 or 20 or 30% lower as your second purchase. And then another 10, 15, 20, 30% lower as your, as your third purchase if it has to go that way. Because ultimately, stocks that are on huge oversold signals and we can project their cash flows on a conservative basis and say they're over uh, sold and they're undervalued that's a great combination if you can buy stocks that are oversold and undervalued against their future earnings you are going to do very very well and in reality that's about the only way to beat the indexes and if the indexes because there's a lot of churn a lot of zombie companies getting kicked out of the S&P 500, for example, over the next seven, eight, nine years. The S&P 500 might just operate in a range, might not break out past about 6,000 before the end of the decade. Why? Because a lot of stocks are shrinking while other ones are rising. And until these small mid caps get into the S&P 500, they don't have much impact on the S&P 500. So again, I implore you, if you've never really invested a lot in small mid caps, even though those have always been the, the leaders in the long run, I believe that you really need to add to what you're normally used to doing. Because I think this is a generational, maybe a multi-generational opportunity to buy small and mid cap stocks. So consider what we talked about here last week, that the bear market probably ends this year. I think it probably double bottoms, as I started to say earlier, early in the fall or sometime after Labor Day. And then again, towards December, when people do their tax loss selling, 
And I know I get this question, why did this one go down? Why did that one go down? Why did this one go down? If everything's going down, is that really the right question to ask? If there's correlation and amplification because the small caps will go down more in the short run, which means that they'll go up more in the long run, stop asking that question. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Just understand the thesis on each stock that I present to you. And I know I give it to you in bits and pieces because it's harder to steal that way. I've had my stock picks stolen by some of the biggest ones out there. Motley Fool used to steal my stuff all the time when I wrote for them. They would take my articles, let them sit in editing for a week. Then somebody else would write a very similar, similar article and get it released before mine. So I quit writing for them. They're not very honest. Then there's a number of other organizations that have done the same thing to me. So I've learned to be careful on how I release information, making it harder to steal. These webinars are where I do most of the complete thought process. If you take the time to listen to these and you understand my sense of humor a little bit, when I say certain things and I say hint, or sometimes I, I usually don't say hint, but I drop a lot of words that mean something. And for those of you who are keeping up, I know I can look at the list here. I know some of you do. Some of our stock picks that we've made in the last couple of years, some of the things that I've said that I've bought, some of the things that I've been buying for a year, very patiently buying them for a year, are going to result in big, big winners. In the meantime, we can kick out extra income along the way. So my option income this year is well over 10%. I haven't measured it exactly. Looks like 12 or 13%. That's kept me you know, a little bit better than the market while I'm accumulating positions at pretty low cost basis and net of premium, even lower cost basis. And that's something I want you to think about. So watch the videos. Last week's I think was pretty important. I edited it down to 47 minutes, got rid of some of the superfluous uh, stuff that wasn't as funny when I listened to it as I thought when I said it. So here you go, retirement income options. I haven't released it yet, I'm still working on it. But the first thing we do, when we want to sell options, sell cash secured puts, so we go to trading view and we screen. And we screen based on monthly, weekly, and daily timeframes. The weekly time frame is usually the one to use in most markets. In the bear market, we generally want to switch to a monthly time frame. Uh, I've explained this a few times. I'll explain it again. The time frame that we're talking about, the interval that we use is just when the measurements get made. So you can have a measurement made at the end of each month, at the end of each week, at the end of each day, at the end of each four hour period, two hour period, one hour period, 30 minute, 15 minute, five minute, one minute. You can set it up any way you want. If I wanted to set this up, and these are just the, the, the presets. If I wanted to have a measurement every 45 days, I could set it up that way. I've never bothered. Why? Because the monthly time frame, which is what I have showing here, right, right now we're on the monthly time frame, is measuring at the end of each month. I have this rated by relative strength. Standard 14 period. You know that when I do my charts, I do it on 13 periods. Doesn't much matter. There's not a lot of significant difference. But these are all oversold. Anything under 30 is basically extremely oversold. And in the 30s is pretty oversold. So there are a lot of stocks right now that are oversold. If you run this the other direction, you can see there's almost nothing overbought, right? There's only five stocks on my list, which is about well, 300 deep right now, 289 deep right now that are overbought. And if you do this on the weekly time frame, which is usually best for writing cash, uh, for, for writing covered calls, we could see on the weekly that there's nothing overbought. So this is a market that is getting particularly oversold across the board. The small and mid caps have taken the brunt of it and the large caps are in the process. Something to think about going forward. The surprises are more likely to be positive now than they are to be negative. What I mean by that, the news has come in negatively for six, seven, eight, nine months now. Almost everything that we're afraid of has been baked in. So you have some very positive things coming up. One would be a balanced build back better. Another would be the semiconductor bill. Another would be some sort of cooperation from OPEC in the short run. Another could possibly be the Federal Reserve backing off, which I think would be the biggest one. And if the Federal Reserve backs off, maybe there's a hot minute where everybody freaks out and goes, oh my God, they're afraid of a recession, so they're backing off. But take a look at unemployment right now. Unemployment, as I've told all the longtime subscribers for years and years, is the harbinger 
of recessions. Unless unemployment goes to 5% or higher, I wouldn't consider a recession as being imminent. And if we do get a recession, I am still on the side that says it will be short and shallow, very minor in nature. I think we're going to get a little bit of correction in housing because of the Fed raising interest rates and probably holding them for a while. And because we are seeing record inventory of housing enter the market. A lot of apartment buildings going up, a lot of condo buildings going up, and pretty many houses going up. So if you go look at any of those numbers, you start to realize this economy was running red hot for a year, year and a half after the COVID bounce or after the COVID correction into the COVID bounce. And we're back to where we were in 2019, but on more of a plateau is what's happening right now. So we're bending the curve to create more of a plateau. So the negativity that you have in the market right now is late. It's really late. You should have been negative on the stock market six months ago before it dropped. Now that it's down 20% and might still go down another 20, you still have to be looking over your shoulder all the time for bad things. However, if you look forward through the windshield, what you're seeing is that those good things are getting closer and closer. So in the next five months or so, you need to find ways to continue to be a buyer. Selling cash secured puts is one of those ways. So again, when I rate this by relative strength index from most sold off, from most sold off on the monthly, so we'll switch that to monthly, what we see is that that satellite basket of stocks, Fourth Industrial Revolution Technology, Planet, Spire, Black Sky, and Satellogic are four of the five most sold off. That's amazing to me because they're all adding recurring revenue and they're all getting to the end. You know, they're all, they're all well into their capital spending phase. Once those satellites are up, it doesn't take much to maintain the networks. Yeah, there's a repair or replacement here and there, software upgrades, things like that. But all of these companies are on schedule to have their full constellations in place in the next three years or so. And they've already all got satellites in the air. So a lot of those pictures you see on CNN or whatever it is you're looking at, uh, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, to show something down below, it's from Maxar or one of these four companies. And Maxar is expensive. So if you take a look at Maxar Technologies and compare it to these companies, and these companies have better technology and higher growth rates, you start to go, hmm, all these companies will probably be worth more than Maxar three, four, five years out as their revenues go up and their CapEx comes down. We've talked about CapEx cycles over and over again. So that's something to keep in mind. So these four stocks we're going to focus on today because you should own all of them. So when we screen, we saw that here. Here are the cash secured puts I want to sell. I want to sell Planet Labs cash secured puts. I'm using the deep into autumn timeframes because the stock that you buy now is what you should have. You should have your starters in place already. And if this market double bottoms sometime early fall and early winter, that's what you want to aim for, for your second put assignment or for your put assignment. So you take a look at Planet Labs. It's trading at like $4.60 today. If you sell a $5 December put for a buck or more, that means that your net price, if it gets put to you in the fall, is four bucks or roughly about 15% lower than today's price. Now, because the strike price is higher than today's price, that means it's more likely that it'll get put to you. Consider that when buying your starter. You might want your starter to be closer to a half a percent than one percent, but all of these you should have a starter on. And if you don't, just buy it. Go put a half a percent of your money into it. Planet Labs is going to be my largest position among these satellite stocks, although Black Sky is close behind. With Spire, there's very little premium in the options and it's a thin market. So I think just take your 1% position. And I don't think you have to wait any longer. It's, it's, it's between $1 and $2 a share, just buy it. If you look at the press releases and quarterly reports and investor presentations of all of these companies, they keep making progress. Everything's going the right direction. But investors on the hype scale, retail investors in particular, are in the valley of despair. That's when you want to buy because you're getting prices that the institutions started to invest at or lower, or that the institutions, because many of these are all of these were SPACs, the institutions are just starting to buy right now. So you're super early investors, your rich guys who you know seed these things and get them started, they're already in and they hold through. 
institutional investors are buying in kind of a weird pattern here because there weren't SEC documents for them to study. Now there are. And the prices are crushed because we had the SPAC hype and then the SPAC sell-off. Normally, the institutional investors would invest right after the smart rich guys and gals. So it's a little flip-flop with the SPACs. But you're seeing institutions start to buy these shares. And now that some of them are in the Russell 2000, remember, the ETFs have to buy them up. Planet Labs is in there. Black Sky is going to be. Can't remember who else got added. I wrote a little piece about it. Black Sky is my second favorite. I think their connection to Palantir is awesome. Palantir has three lines of business. Black Sky can be a part of all of them by providing these satellite data and images. And Black Sky, located in Virginia, right down the street from Pentagon City, is pretty connected. So if you read up about this company, you realize, oh boy, the connections here are pretty substantial. So this is a 2% position for me, almost. And I'm selling these puts to try to get the rest of the way. I want Planet Labs and Black Sky both to be about 2% positions, maybe up to 3 2 to 3%. Spire Global and Satellogic, I'll keep down around 1% until I start to see signs that there might be M&A or that they're really just, you know, pumping money into the, into the system. Lots of free cash flow. Satellogic might have the best technology of all four of these companies, but they're not as connected, right? Planet Labs in bed with Google, Black Sky in bed with the government and Palantir. Spire Global up in uh, Canada is pretty connected in the navigation industry. Satellogic is uh, out of South Africa and they probably end up doing a lot of business, a lot of business uh, in Europe, because Europe will just buy the best technology and Satellogic might have it. So I am going to end up with a position because I sold August $7.50 puts back when the stock was about $7.50. Uh, almost certainly these are going to get put to me in you know four or five weeks, whatever it is, six weeks. I'm going to sell another batch. I'm going to sell some Novembers just to defray my costs and round me up to that 1% position. So I don't need to sell too many of these. But for you, if you took a half a percent position in Satellogic now, then sold these puts for another half, per, uh, half percent, I think you'd be in pretty good shape. Way out in December and November, those longer durations, right? Normally we only sell the puts for a month or two out to catch the immediate time value deterioration, but we are selling these to get extra premium. All right. So a couple others that I like on the list. Coinbase, I still don't know how to value the company. I really don't. Um, but if Bitcoin falls more close to Shooter's 13,000 target, which he's, you know, he's moved his target down several times. I've always said 20-ish thousand for Bitcoin, even when it was 50 and 60. Um, and he's been moving it down. And the more immediate Elliott waves are suggesting about 13,000 as the bottom. Uh, you saw a headline today where people are saying 10,000 before 30,000. I'd be shocked if Bitcoin hits 10,000. There's just too many billionaires and institutions that want to buy this. So I think that the bearish narrative here is to keep the price down while they accumulate. Shake as many people out of the tree as possible. To me, this seems like a classic move of of Wall Street beating something up, of the internet taking off with it, of the bears and the those conspir conspiring behind the scenes to accumulate shares, trying to scare people out. I think the Bitcoin is a buy right now. And I think you scale in as it goes down the same way I've told you about a number of times. Coinbase, if it survives the shakeout, if it survives the crypto winter, winter it's probably a big winner long time because there's almost no competition coming anymore. All the ideas, all the big competitors that were talking about coming online, yeah, they're not doing it anymore. It'll be years before they get the capital to do it again. So when there's a big shakeout in an industry like this, all the bright ideas, all the people who are saying, oh, we we're going to enter this market, their financing dries up. So the survivors come out much, much stronger. Now, again, I don't know exactly where to deal with Coinbase. Now, I do have a little bit of Coinbase exposure through the Vanek Digital Transformation ETF, which I don't really include in Global Trends ETF, although I'll, I'll make a note about it again, uh, because I think it's high enough risk 
that it's not for everybody. But for me and for people who are growth investors and more growthy than income-y, um, I think it's something to own because you get exposure to Square and Coin and Marathon and Riot and a bunch of others that are important in the crypto space. When you take a look at the chart for Coinbase, you start to see that right down in here, I mean, nobody was interested, nobody was interested, nobody was interested. Price went down and down and down. Suddenly, you start to get interest. A lot of it big investors, right? Because retail doesn't do this. There's some big money coming in here and it starts to level off. Now, that doesn't mean it can't have another leg down. To me, based on the volume being the highest ever down here, I think this was the washout. I think this is where stronger hands have started to buy with the idea that Bitcoin is going to make a comeback and so is Ethereum. A lot of the shit coins are done. I have two that are trading basically for zero and Coinbase won't even handle the transactions anymore. Good thing I only put $10 into them. I just did that to track them. So my $10 investments are now like, you know, $1.37 or something in one case. And I think in the other case, 75 cents, big drops. But Bitcoin and Ethereum are still going to be around because of the digital contracts and because of store of value. This might be a place if you are super risk tolerant, if you're very risk tolerant and you're looking for something that might shoot right back up to its highs in the next two or three years, a two or three year seven bagger wouldn't suck. And this might do it, but it's a high risk move. I don't want to bother with the options unless I'm trading calls over a shooter's trading room on fundamental trends. It's a hint, guys. Um, but this is probably something that if you wanted to have a taste, you could probably take a taste right in here, right near that red line. And then Ginkgo Bioworks will finish with. Ginkgo Bioworks, biotech platform, and the data that they've accumulated are ridiculously, ridiculously well done. And the data is overwhelming. The companies that are getting involved with Ginkgo Bioworks from major, major pharma companies and biotech companies to little institutions, you know, and universities and five-man teams that have a great idea is just unbelievable to me. Ginkgo Bioworks could be collecting royalties from hundreds, hundreds of companies in the next several years. There's huge call buying going on in Ginkgo Bioworks right now. And it's for just a month or two out. So I don't know what these call buyers are expecting. But as Shooter says, and I've said for years, somebody always knows, right? There's inside information all the time. And they shuffle it through three or four different people so that it's, you know, they can't prove the cheating. But when there's this much call activity, unusual option buying, you have to scratch your head a little bit and say, well, do I just hold my nose? Well, at $3 a share, give or take, um, I'm going to add to my Ginkgo Bioworks position. I have a 1% position now. I'm going to sell these $3 December puts for at least 75 cents. I'll see if I can get a little bit more. I'm going to make that trade right after we get off the air. And uh, this is one that I think that Ginkgo Bioworks can be a 10 to 20 times uh, riser here in the next five to 10 years. That's just how much revenue is potentially, potentially uh, projecting out. It's just the numbers are so big that at a $5 billion market cap, if they help uh, Biogen or somebody, uh, Biogen is one of the companies that's on their platform. If they help a big company or even a little company, it doesn't even matter. If they help dozens of companies develop biotech and pharma products, as well as food products and different chemicals, the, the royalty picture is just, just, so, just so huge, right? Think about the other platform companies, Google, Salesforce, Amazon, you know, different definitions of platform, but platform companies have made most of the money in the last 20 years. Ginkgo Bioworks is taking it into healthcare and industry and agriculture. And it's just, I don't know what number to put on this stuff because every time I play with numbers, I just, I look at them and I'm like, my God, this could be a half a trillion dollar company pretty quick. Have a position in Ginkgo Bioworks, hold your nose, save it for the long term. Make sure you get that starter if you don't have it. And I think that these puts are a great way for you to reduce your cost basis and potentially add to your position. And as they have good news, it's okay to pyramid up and just keep on adding even on the way up. Because I don't think 50 is the top side for this stock. I think ultimately it's a three-figure stock. It's three right now. So... 
read up on Ginkgo Bioworks. I've reminded you a thousand times now uh, to watch this company. You are getting a ridiculous, again, this is another one of the SPACs. So five SPACs here and one in crypto. These are the types of stocks that have been destroyed. And if you can find the needles in the haystack, and I think we're probably going to be, depending on Coinbase, we might get them all. These can be life-changing money. Now, if you're a retiree and you're like, oh my God, this scares the hell out of me. Don't buy the starters, just sell the puts. Because a lot of times those puts will just expire. And if you get the stock put to you, you didn't have a starter to begin with, you get it super, super cheap. And the one thing I'd remind you is when stocks are this oversold, right? This is the question you ask. Will they be in business in five years? And if the answer is yes, got to hold your nose and just start to buy the stocks. The only company that I'm not positive the answer is yes is Coinbase. Pretty sure, but not positive. And that's why I haven't really pushed it, but I want you to be aware of it. All the satellite companies will be here in one form or another. <clears throat> there might be some M&A. Ginkgo Bioworks will be here one way or another. They might get bought out. They should get bought out, but I think that they're, they're going to avoid it. All right, any questions? Somebody asked me, do I see DAPP and BLOK, a couple of ETFs in the crypto space, filling a similar allocation? No, take a look at their holdings. Much different holdings. I'm using DAP because I like the basket better than I like Block, but Block has options to trade. So the folks at Fundamental Trends may trade Block. I like DAP. I'm not really looking to trade options on it. I just want that basket of... 15, 16 stocks, which comprise most of the portfolio. Somebody asks about Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Again, the reason you buy Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is to take advantage of the narrowing in the discount. So right now, the discount to Bitcoin is 30 some odd percent. As it shrinks closer to 10%, which is probably going to be normal historically, you know, you, you can sell it. So it's just a trade. All these Bitcoin ETFs are just a trade. You have to take a look at the discount. If it's a big discount, you can make a trade based on the narrowing of the discount. I'm not bothering with it. I have enough exposure through DAP and Square and Marathon that I'm not bothering with Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. And I buy Bitcoin directly. So I have my purse over at Coinbase and it's small. I've actually uh, started moving. I've started doing the research on which cold wallet I want, you know, which piece of hardware I want just to put my Bitcoin on because I don't want to see if Coinbase goes bankrupt, I don't want all my money disappearing or being put on hold while the bankruptcy is in process. But Coinbase seems to be handling everything pretty conservatively, uh, but I don't want to keep more than a thousand or two on the platform. So I'm slowly moving things over to a cold wallet just in case. But, you know, the only way that Coinbase really goes bankrupt is if my cryptos are worth almost nothing in the first place. So there's that. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I'm not wrong about Bitcoin or Ethereum. You know, I've avoided gigantic mistakes in my career by keeping my asset allocation managed, right? Even when I have an on-track problem, you know, it wasn't much of my money. So, you know, I just eat it. It's part of the game. It was a great idea. They didn't execute. There you have it. And they, they ran into a market that was unforgiving. But you take a look at most of the other stocks, you're like, hmm, you know, Nutrien. I mean, how many of you bought Nutrien three years ago? And then again on the crypto, on the COVID crash, made a ton of money on Nutrien. And then I told you to sell it almost exactly top ticked it. And we sold it. And now we have to start thinking about buying it back sometime later this year. <clears throat> um, people ask are asking about small and mid cap ETFs and 401ks. If you got them, you know, they're usually not the greatest options, but some of the 401k plans have picked out like a Royce fund or something like that for small cap or mid cap. You just have to take a look at the funds that are available. If you have good options, you know, good, good choices, then, then go ahead and do it. But there's so many bad 401ks out there. They all just index because they think that's somehow going to protect the owners. See the, in the financial industry, the financial industry was told by the management of the broker dealers to sell 401k plans that are loaded with index funds because you can't get in trouble that way, which is complete and utter bullshit, right? It's part of the whole lemming thing. Well, if everybody goes over the cliff, then it's okay. It doesn't make your 401k good. It just means that it's, you know, lawsuit protection for the owners of the company and for the people selling the plans. If you have a brokerage window in your 401k, you should almost universally use it for most of your money. If you have a 401k through 
Nationwide or Transamerica or John Hancock or whoever, and they have a brokerage window to swap, but it costs you a couple hundred bucks a year, you should use it. Even if they just give you a wider variety of mutual funds and ETFs. Some of you have a plan that'll let you buy stocks, but they limit the stocks usually. You know, you should almost try, always try to use the brokerage window if you have it available. And if you don't, you have one of those crappy 401ks that are all about indexing, but it's still a great place to put money because it matches and it's pre-tax. You know, you have to just consider your asset allocation in other places compared to your 401k, right? It ends up just being a math equation. So if you have good choices for small and mid caps in your 401k, yeah, you should use them. Also being asked is, could one just invest in Mara instead of Bitcoin? I think that's a horrible idea. I think taking a diversified approach is the way to go, and I think you should own some Bitcoin, right? Companies have execution risk. My, I'll write the whole piece on this eventually, I guess, but uh, my crypto exposure is through Square, through Marathon, through DAP and all the companies in there. And then I, I dollar cost average into Ethereum. Um, I, and I just send the money monthly, but <clears throat> I've actually switched that lately. So I just put cash into my Coinbase account, then I buy when I want to. And I've never sold any Bitcoin or Ethereum since I started doing it this way. I traded Bitcoin twice prior, but in the last six, seven months, I'm just nibbling into Bitcoin. I bought some the other day and the Ethereum... I haven't bought in three months, so I'm going to buy some more probably, maybe today. We'll see. Uh, I think that the crypto crash for Bitcoin and Ethereum is closer to over with, maybe than anything else. I think stocks keep selling off through the end of the year. Uh, but I think that Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think they're going to lead the new bull market. I think they'll come out first. And then it'll be the small caps, and then the mid caps, and then the large caps. Because people who sell... They're large caps. When they finally capitulate, they're always the last ones to get back in. So it's going to be your high beta assets, the ones that you think of as risky, which is the wrong way to think about them. But your high beta assets are going to be the ones that come out in the new bull market making the most money. So as my small caps and mid caps go up, I'll gradually add you know, some more large caps as I can find them. But because I'm you know, 30-ish percent cash on aggregate, and in my personal account, you know, when everything finally does bottom out later this year, I'm just going to get it all in, right? It's going to be an all-in moment. You don't keep anything on the side at that point. You just have faith that time will do what time always does, which is make things better. So a year ago, I was telling you to get ready to sell. Seven, eight months ago, I was telling you to sell almost everything. Now we've been nibbling in, right? More and more, right? We still, we were buying small caps last year that... You know, we're down 70% on. So what? Now we buy them again and again. And all of a sudden, our cost basis is pretty darn close to the price that only a small rally would take to get us there. Then if we get the growth over the next three, four, five, ten 10 years, these become very, very big, big holdings. Small companies become big companies. Who said that? Peter Lynch. Who bemoaned in a letter, hey, if I only had a billion dollars to manage, I'd make 50% every year. Warren Buffett said that. Why did he say that? Because he said, I would love to be able to invest in small companies. That's where the inefficiencies in the market are. It's where people don't understand things. It's where the analysts don't have coverage because they can't get paid. Your biggest opportunities are in small caps. Always have been. Always will be. Mid caps are, I think, the perfect blend of risk and reward. They're past the startup and often the capex phases where things are lumpy and hard to decipher. And the mid caps over full cycles have always outperformed. Small caps outperform early cycle. Large caps outperform late cycle. Mid caps are usually steady eddy. And when you get those opportunities to buy small and mid caps on the cheap, like they are now, and these small caps that are obnoxiously cheap, means so many stocks down 50, 60, 70, 80, 90% that will be here in five years. So all you got to do is find the ones that will be here in five years, and you're going to make a lot of money. And you can sell puts right now on these companies. Palantir actually should be on this list, but it's not right where I screen is. You know, we did that a while back. But Planet Labs, Black Sky, Ginkgo Bioworks, you should sell puts on all these, even if you're retired. And if you have a starter position already, you just have to decide, could you take more at a lower price? If you don't have a starter position, skip the starter position if you're a retiree. 
and just sell the put. Because if this gets put to you, it's going to be so cheap, so cheap, that there's almost no risk. The only risk is that they go out of business and these companies have satellites in the air. How could they go out of business? Get bought out, <clears throat> maybe dilute a little, but they're operating businesses with long-term contracts like a Metis. All right, have a good day. I'll get this edited as quickly as I can. So probably have it up tonight.